Well, thanks, Pastor, for having us here. Thanks for your perseverance in uh, extending these Tuesday nights one more week, I think, than normal, so that we could still be fit in. We're very honored, uh, Karen and I, to be here. Um, it does my heart so much good to see a new generation of preacher coming along. Of course, he's been here forever, since he was probably eight years old, he's been part of this pastoral staff, but uh, uh, he, he's younger than Pastor Willette, but uh, God has provided for a wonderful succession plan here. Uh, a church gets, uh, runs a great risk if they have to say goodbye to one pastor and then there's a gap and then they go out fishing in the waters all across the world for a new guy who may or may not be the kind of guy they thought they were getting. And then uh, calamity comes and uh, the churches just fall apart. They become a different church. And you, you, God's provided for you all here in such a wonderful way. Uh, I know you treasure that. I, I, I know you treasure... Pastor Willette, and you treasure Pastor Howell, and you realize they're gifts from God to you, and I know you pray for them. They have the same temptations, the same struggles and strife in their hearts that you and I have, and uh, we're all part of, uh, of the human race, <laughs> and so keep them in your prayers. I know you do. I know you do. Don't take for granted. And folks, keep the devil on the outside of these doors. He doesn't belong in here. This is the Lord's place. So uh, my, my grandfather, who founded BJU uh, 94 years ago, uh, taught my father and me, and I taught our son Stephen, who was pastor for 10 years till his health uh, interfered. Uh, be a devil sniffer. He stinks. Learn to smell him when he shows up. You may not be able to recognize him, but you can tell he's in the atmosphere. <laughs> so start praying hard and don't let him hang around. Once you find out where he is or who he is, uh, get rid of him. <laughs> this is God's place. Don't bring him in your hearts here on Sundays and Wednesdays. Don't bring the devil here with you. Uh, don't let him come in the car as you ride with your family here. Uh, get yourself prepared for the worship of God. Uh, don't just come from strife and bitterness and controversy and whatever else has burdens you down and then expect to receive a blessing from the Lord. Our time is short so much I'd like to say. Uh, we, of course, are happy to have Trinity at the university right now, and if the Lord should uh, press upon the hearts of some of you, uh, there are some uh, 94 majors, I think, in uh, just about anything you would want to study, in law and medicine and nursing and the sciences and course uh, in the school of religion and education and business and be where God wants you to be that's all that counts keep in mind folks parents keep in mind that where you send your children will make the major difference in how they spend the rest of your life it doesn't mean it's a choice between a good school and a bad school a choice between two good schools the teachers are different the philosophy is different. The spirit is different. So keep in mind that your child will never be the same regardless of where you send them. Never be the same. It's transformative during those years. Doesn't mean they'll come out bad. Well, if you send them to state school, you can probably depend on it. A good chance it will happen. Okay, it doesn't have to happen. Good chance it will happen. But anyway, between two good schools, um, and uh, pray for God's direction. Pray for God's direction. And don't send them anywhere you haven't visited. It's very important. Very important. You can't depend on the promotional materials. You need to look in the dorms and sit in class and go to chapel and say, 
is my child going to come out here loving Jesus Christ more than when I sent him or her? That's what you need to know. Uh, I understand you've just had your first day of school, or yesterday was your first day of school? Yesterday? Today? Last week? Oh, oh man, I thought today was, I thought the teachers were full of nervousness still from the first day. Well, the first week, uh, you, you spent your first week being nervous. Um, transitions in the new years, I've spent my life in Christian education, it's just traumatic. Your, your, your stomach is in knots for days as it gets going. Uh, keep in mind, folks, the Christian school can't teach everything your child needs to know. Uh, the biggest part of it starts way before they get there in your home and, of course, in the church. Heard about a guy. He was in, working in a grocery store in Mobile, Alabama. Anybody here ever been to Mobile, Alabama? Really? You escaped. Good. All right. Mobile, Alabama, the end of the world is there. It's musty smelling, it's damp and dank, and it's just kind of an oppressive sort of atmosphere, climate. Well, this guy worked in a grocery store there, and an old lady came in one day and said, Sonny, I want to buy half a head of lettuce. His boy said, sir, ma'am, I am sorry. We, we, we have to sell you the whole head of lettuce. Can't sell you half a head of lettuce. She said, well, I'm old. It was spoiled. I just want half a head of lettuce. He said, I, I just, I can't do that, man. I'm sure my manager wouldn't let me. She said, well, go ask him. So he went back, found the manager, said, sir, there's some wacko lady up here. She wants to buy half a head of lettuce. And he noticed just then she had followed him and was standing right there beside him. And he looked at her and said, oh, sir, this lovely lady wants to buy the other half a head of lettuce. He said, sure, sell it to her. So later, the manager called the boy and said, son, that was brilliant. Where did you learn to think on your feet like that? Oh, he said, sir, I don't recall ever formally learning it. He said, I just kind of grew up being able to do that uh, back there in Reading, Pennsylvania, my hometown. He said, sir, by the way, Way down here in Mobile, you probably don't know much about Reading, Pennsylvania, my hometown. I love my hometown. Let, let me tell you about Reading, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's the home of the world's ugliest women and the world's greatest hockey players. And the manager started to grow red from the neck up like a thermostat, uh, a th like a thermometer. And he gritted his teeth and he said, young man, I'll have you know my wife is from Reading, Pennsylvania. Oh, he said, really? What hockey team did she play for? <laughs> well, some things no school will be able to teach. Some things are innate. And uh, thank God for the God-given gifts and the parental given gifts. Let's pray together. Father, in these few minutes, help me to be your servant. Come here for one reason only, Lord. Let your word abide with us and speak to us through the Holy Spirit. It's all in vain if you don't speak to us through the Holy Spirit. So I pray now your presence, your help. We have felt your presence already. And let your word be unfolded to us as the Holy Spirit who gave your word to the authors. Let him reveal it to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Please open your Bibles to Psalm 12. As you sit here tonight for the rest of the service, remember... This is the word of the Lord. I have nothing to give you that would do you any good. If I tried to give you my thoughts, you would be wasting your time. But we've come to hear the word of the Lord. So let's expect him. This is a Bible conference. Let's expect him to give something from the Bible to us that will help us along the journey immediately before us, give us understanding of what is going on in our culture, in this world today. And uh, may God send us out of here uh, armed with the sword of the Spirit. I want to ask you a question. What generation are you part of? What generation are you part of? If you look at Psalm 12 with me, we're going to look at uh, two, two other psalms, Psalm 49 and Psalm 17, if you'd kind of like to keep those handy. Uh, what generation are you part of? They tell us 
the sociologist, that there are six living generations in America. Six living generations. The GI generation, which was born 1901 to 1926. The silent generation, born 1927 to 1945. Baby boomers, born 1946 to 1964, Gen X, born 1965 to 1980, the Millennials, born 1981 to 1996, Gen Z, born 1997 to the present. Now, there are in this world right now members of all six of these generations. Not many of the GI generation left, but there are still some. You and I are part of one of these generations. Uh, the generations are known by their unique characteristics. Uh, not every generation has just these characteristics, and then suddenly, with the turn of the next year, a whole new set of characteristics came to the next generation that followed. But basically, and, uh, and uh, normally, each of these generations, because of their associations with each other and the, and the climate of the world in which they were born have certain characteristics. Uh, for instance, the GI generation was strongly interested in personal morality and, nearly absolute, and near absolute standards of right and wrong, had a strong sense of personal civic duty and how they voted, etc. okay? This is just surface, just giving you a brief sketch. The silent generation from 27 to 45 uh, they were the Korean and Vietnam War veterans. Uh, they were characterized by their self-discipline, their self-sacrificing, and their cautious approach to life. The baby boomers from 46 to 64, uh, they were known as the me generation. Uh, women of this generation began working outside of the home in record numbers. They were the first TV generation, the first divorce generation. They began accepting homosexuals and it's the first generation to use the word retirement. Gen X, 65 to 80, uh, they were eager to make marriage work and to be there for their children. Uh, they tended to commit to themselves rather than to an organization or to a specific career. They married late in life after probably cohabiting before they married and they were quick to divorce and from them were many single parents. The millennials were born 81 to 2000. Uh, they were an unusual generation. They, they felt enormous uh, academic pressures in school. Uh, they never knew a world without computers. Um, they were told over and over again they were special and they came to believe that they were expected people to treat them that way. Uh, Gen Z, born after 2001, uh, they were um, they were the KGOY kids, kids growing older, younger, makers of toys like uh, Mattel. Uh, they used to make toys for based about 10 years old. Uh, in 2000, it dropped to three years old because after three years old, when children became four or five, they began to play on computers and less interested in toys and more interested in, in uh, electronics. You teachers and all have understood all that. So, but that's not the generation I'm asking you who, of whom you are part. In each of these generations, there are two other generations. The generation of the unrighteous and the generation of the righteous. Gen U, the unrighteous. Gen R, the righteous. Keep that in mind. I'll be talking about that a great deal here at the first of the message. God said in Psalm 14:5 through his servant, God is in the generation of the righteous. The generation of the righteous. Before you got saved, you were part of the generation of the unrighteous. Every lost person in this world is part of the generation of the unrighteous. You did nothing to merit the Gen R generation. 
It wasn't because there was anything so special about you. It was because God's grace was manifest to you and His saving mercy brought to you. And you received the Savior. That made you part of the generation of the righteous. You're part of one of these six generations too. But you're part of the generation of the righteous. That's what makes you different in this day. I want us to look at some of the characteristics of the generation of the unrighteous because if you feel like I, I do, and I'm, I've lived a long time, obviously, I've never sensed such vexation in the lives of God's people as there is today. Such emotional turmoil, such stressed lives, so much perplexity, so much pressures, Fears, though God has not given us the spirit of fear. Certainly not all of the unrighteous generation are hostile to God's people. Some of them are very nice people. Some of them are nicer than the generation of the righteous, to be quite honest with you. They can be nice neighbors, good bosses, good co-workers, kind people. Uh, there are many things we can enjoy and do together with them. We can make friends with them. In fact, we must. We can participate with them in civic events, sporting events. We shop with them. We live in their neighborhoods. We drive the cars they made. We're part, we, we're not ever separate from the generation of the unrighteous. But there's so much that is distinctly different. It's the grace of God that made the difference that puts you in the generation of the righteous. And yet you didn't leave the generation of the unrighteous. That's why it's hard to live as a Christian in the world, isn't it? That's, that's the problem. And that's what we struggle with. That's why it's uncomfortable to be part of the generation of the righteous. While we live among the generation of the unrighteous. So there are three passages I want to take you to. Beginning with the 12th uh, Psalm which is the psalm that describes the generation of the persuasive tongue. As I read these few verses, you listen for that concept. It describes the generation of the persuasive tongue. By the way, can you think right off the top of your head of the most persuasive tongue? Can you think of the first persuasive tongue that entered into the world apart from God's speech to Adam and Eve, what's the first persuasive tongue of the world of the unrighteous? The serpent. The serpent's voice in the garden. Has God said? Do you mean to tell me God said something so ridiculous as you should not eat that tree? Why, God's a meanie. Why would a good God wouldn't withhold anything from you? It was very persuasive. Keep in mind that these people had walked in the presence of God every day in the garden. He was there and taught them. If you think, my friend, you have the intelligence and the, the ingenuity and the wherewithal to escape the whisperings of Satan, you're the next victim. Adam and Eve didn't escape it. And they walked and heard God's voice every day. The generation of the persuasive tongue. Here's what the psalmist thought about it. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. He said, God, help. Help me living in the midst of this kind of generation. This generation speaks vanity, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips, with double heart, do they speak? The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongues that speak proud things, who have said, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? The oppression of the poor for the sighing of the needy. Now will I arise, says the Lord. I will set him in safety from among him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou wilt keep them, O Lord. Thou wilt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. 
David was so vexed by this generation of the persuasive tongue. And he said, Lord, the reason is godly people have perished. We're not hearing their voice, their tongue very much. The faithful man, where is his voice? Where is his tongue? Where, is, where are these people? Well, some of them had died off. Do you ever see, when you see preachers die that you've listened to, or radio, or followed and around as they spoke in the area, they die and you say, who's going to take their place? There's nobody else. Nobody's going to follow. Well, the Lord's not going to leave himself without a witness. He's promised that. But you get the feeling after a while that the generation of the righteous are getting fewer and fewer and fewer. And the generation of the unrighteous are coming in like a flood against us with their perverse ideas, with their godless worldview, with their man-centeredness, with their secularism. They're coming in on us like a flood. Churches are getting older. Churches are getting smaller. The, many of the existing churches have completely changed their doctrine. They don't believe the Bible anymore. They've gotten in step with homosexual marriage and transgenderism and all of these other things. Lord, help us. Where are the godly? Where are the righteous? Sometimes we feel like that too, don't we? Well, some of them had died. But as we said at the start of the service, there's another generation. God's going to have his people to fill his pulpits. That's his business. He loves the church more than we do. It's the church of the living God. It's not our church. It's not pastor's church. But there's another reason that it seems in our day that the godly man ceases and that the faithful are no longer among the children of men. And I believe it's because of the intimidation of the tongue. The tongues that are teaching in the secular colleges. The tongues that are in the media. The tongues that are in the mouth of the politicians. The tongues in the judges' decisions from the Supreme Court on down. Their tongues have so intimidated us and made us feel in such a minority that we've lost our tongues. We've tried to lose our tongues. We're wearing camo, as it were, so that the generation of the righteous are not distinguishable from the unrighteous generation. We're afraid. We're, we're intimidated. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. This is the day, my friend. Not to hide, not to fear for your own neck, your own reputation. This is the day to speak for the Lord because the voices that speak for him are getting fewer and fewer. The Bible speaks here about those who speak against the poor. I don't think this only means the poor whose pocketbooks are empty. That would include most of us here. The Bible speaks about the poor in spirit, the humble. The Lord Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 3, blessed, happy are the poor in spirit. These people speak against the poor in spirit. The rising up of the generation of the unrighteous with their tongues are taking a toll upon the generation of the righteous. And David just cried out and said, God, will you deliver us Will you preserve us from this generation who does this thing that he is speaking about here in this song? 
Does it seem to you that the wicked walk on every side and that the vilest of men are exalted? Yeah, they get elected. They become prominent. They become celebrities. The vilest of people. It's nothing new. It was happening in David's time. And he said, this is, this is why the generation of the righteous, we cry out to you, O God, deliver us from these people. They're on every side. And I, that got hold of me and gave me some understanding. I wanted to share it with you because I think we live in the generation of the persuasive tongue filled even with the serpent's subtleties. Secondly, there is the generation of the living dead, if you would turn to Psalm 49. Beginning at verse 6. They that trust in their wealth, the psalmist here is describing the generation of the living dead. They that trust in their wealth boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of the soul is precious, and it ceases forever. That he should still live forever and not see corruption. He's describing the desire of these in the generation of the unrighteous. He seeth that the wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish and leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man being in honor abides not. He's like the beasts that perish. This, their way, is their folly, yet... Their posterity approved their saying. He said, these guys who are part of this generation, they understand. I'm not going to be here forever. I'm going to leave my lands to, to somebody else. I can't take my wealth with me. But what they are teaching their children, their children latch on to. And though this generation understands it, their children don't understand it. And so they spend their lives trying to hold on to their wealth, trying to gain wealth. And it's a sign of success in life. If I can just have a little bit more, if I can just have more lands called by my name, then I'll be more successful in this world. They learn that from their fathers. Materialistic fathers. I hope you're not one of them. Any of you fathers here. Then he continues. Verse 14. Like sheep, they're laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. And the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. And the beauty, their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. He shall receive me. Be not thou afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lived, he blessed his soul. And men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. Man that is in honor and understands not is like the beasts that perish. The generation described here as people who appeared to be living the good life but were totally dead people. Generation U, generation of the ungodly, is all about death. This is the generation who will die in their sins, verse 14. Like sheep, they're laid in the grave. Death shall feed upon them. The upright shall have dominion over them. That is, those who remain after they're in the grave, they'll have dominion. Their beauty shall consume away in the grave from where they live. The grave is inescapable to the generation of the unrighteous. They live in pride, verse 12. In honor, he abides not. He's like the beasts that perish. God has a way of describing mankind in a most genuine and real but unwelcome way. 
And that's what he's doing here. They boasted themselves in their riches, verse 6. They see other men, both wise and stupid men, and they realize that honor doesn't live forever, that all men are like beasts that perish, that this is a way of folly. They understand that, but it's all they have. There's no future beyond the world of death in which they live. They will live with the generation of the unrighteous, that those described here, this is where they live. Man is one step from the grave, one heartbeat from eternity. Men in honor while they live and know not God are like the beasts who perish. In verse 20, God will redeem the soul of his child from the power of the grave and shall receive him. My friends, if you're in the generation of the righteous, just think of this. Verse 15 should be a verse you just get your arms around, that you embrace, and that you should let embrace you. God will redeem my soul, the writer says, from the power of the grave. He shall receive me. The generation of the righteous will live forever where God lives. No matter how bad it is here. No matter how persecuted, vilified you may be by some in the generation of the unrighteous. You have everything to look forward to. The generation of the righteous live in the midst of the generation of the unrighteous that can't solve the death problem. They can put men on the moon. They can find vaccines. They can do a lot of things, but they can't solve the death problem. God has solved that for us. Where he lives, we'll live also. Thank God if you're in the generation of the righteous. And let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. And then lastly, in closing, the generation of the unrighteous is a generation of young lions. A generation of young lions. Turn back to Psalm 17, would you? This is not my description. This comes right out of the text. The generation of the young lions. I'll begin in verse 6. Notice again that the psalmist begins his description with a cry to God. I've called upon thee, for thou wilt hear me, O God. Incline thine ear to me. Hear my speech. Show thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand, them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against thee. Lord, show the difference between the generation of the righteous and the generation of the unrighteous. That's what verse 7 is. That's part of David's cry. Show the difference. Keep me as the apple of thine eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings from the wicked that oppress me, from the deadly enemies that compass me about. They are enclosed in their own fat, their prosperous God. With their mouth, they speak proudly. They have now compassed us in our steps. They have set their eyes, bowing down to the earth like as a lion that is greedy of his prey. And as it were, a young lion lurking in the secret places. Arise, O oh Lord, disappoint him, cast him down. Deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. From men which are thy hand, O Lord, from men of the world, the unrighteous generation, which have their portion in this life and whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure. They are full of children and have the rest of their substance, leave the rest of their substance to their babes. And we'll save verse 15 for a moment. He said, God, 
I feel like I'm being pursued by this generation of wicked people, this unrighteous generation. They're after the church. They're after my family. Everywhere I turn, their influence is just, it's after me to devour me. And if you feel that way, you feel just like David felt in, in his prayer to God in this psalm. Lord, I've called upon you. When are you going to deliver me from this generation? Show me your marvelous loving kindness. Show me your saving right hand. Save me from those who oppress me, from these deadly enemies who compass me about. They're enclosing on me. Years ago, just very quickly, I was, my wife and I, my first wife, Bennett, and I were in South Africa. We took a couple of three days off. The missionary took us over to the Kruger National Park, the game park that is the whole western, uh, the whole eastern side of South Africa. And we spent a night or two in the park, in an enclosure, the most wonderful experience. One day we were at a water hole. We were up on a little rise, and we were watching this water hole. There were six um, uh, antelope that's down there having the water, and we could see on the hillside behind a male lion in the middle, two female lions on each side, and in a pincer move, they were coming down to envelop their prey, to have their breakfast. There was a giraffe standing here. He was just like this. He was standing there watching, not mus his, a muscle didn't twitch, not a hair. He was scared to death too. He was watching what we were watching. The male line would move a little bit. The females would move a little bit out in front of him. He'd move and they'd move a little more. And suddenly, the antelope got a whiff of them, I guess. And they took off. And as they took off, these lions came. But it was too late. They had escaped. It was a fascinating sight. And I think that's what the psalmist is trying to show us here, that this generation is like a bunch of lions and young lions, and they can't wait to get upon their prey, the generation of the righteous. Don't mean to make you paranoid about this. As I said, there are many wonderful, wonderful people who yet need to know Christ. They're not our enemies. We don't isolate from them. We don't just move in our own circles. Please don't understand, misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying we should be isolated. It would be wicked if we tried to be because it's unbiblical. God put us here to get the gospel to those people. So we mingle with them every way we legitimately can. But we must remember also that among them are a lot of influencers that are doing their best to hinder the work of God and to destroy the people of God. Verse 9 describes them as a wicked generation. In, in the original language, the word wicked there means morally wrong. This is a morally wrong generation. That's what makes them wicked. They speak proudly. They see themselves as speakers of all wisdom, verse 10. And yet, my friend, they're described in verse 14 as the hand of the Lord. Did you notice that? They're tools. Like a carpenter has a saw or a plane or a screwdriver, a chisel in his hand. These are tools in God's hand. This segment of the unrighteous generation who are evil in their intent, intent against the work of God and the people of God. He said, they're tools. They're in God's hands. He's not going to let them go further than he wants them to. When he's through with them, he'll put them down and pick up another tool. Nebuchadnezzar was such a person. Pharaoh was such a person. God throughout history. Our God, our great God, our almighty God uses his enemies as his tools to accomplish his purposes. Aren't you glad you're on his side? <laughs> he said those, those tools that are in his hand, they have their portion in this life, and then they're gone. They'll die. They're part of the generation of death. 
And when they die, all they will ever have and ever wanted is gone forever. They have their portion in this life, verse 14, filled with good things. But it's all over. They will never set foot on this world again after they're in the grave. You and I will come back to rule and reign for a thousand years with the Lord. And then this old earth will be burned up like a cinder in the fires of God's judgment. And the Lord will make a new heaven and a new earth. This is our home. We're going to spend eternity here as it was in the Garden of Eden. New heaven and new earth all combined together somehow. When we go to the grave, we don't say goodbye to the earth forever. God made us for this earth. Sin robs men of this earth and sends them to an eternal hell. When God saved us, he made us eternally prepared for a new life. <laughs> that includes a new heaven and a new earth. What a difference in the generations. And he said in verse 15, after describing their end, all the sadness of losing everything that they lived for, never to see it again. But he said, as for me, verse 15, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in thy likeness. My friend, God who knows every hair of our head, who knows the end of our life from the beginning of our life, holds us in the palm of his hand. <laughs> he knows that as long as we live in a sin-cursed world, we're not ever quite satisfied. And the generation of the ungodly are like us in that. They are not satisfied because the God void in them is empty. It's full of self and possessions. It's not full of the Lord himself. You and I who are full of the Lord, who is living in us in the person of the Holy Spirit, we too are not ever completely satisfied, right? There's something that isn't quite right. The Lord isn't back on his earth again, but he's going to be. And when I awake in his likeness, all that is too much still like the generation of the unrighteous is going to be over and I'm in his likeness for eternity. No wonder the writer of the Revelation said in the 14th chapter, I shall be satisfied when I awake in thy likeness. Be glad you're in the generation of the righteous. Give him praise every day that he reached you with his saving gospel. And do your best to get that good news to everybody you know. If you're here tonight and are not part of the generation of the righteous, if you listen carefully to these psalms and would reread them, you'll find out how hopeless you are. And that you have nothing to look forward to but judgment when you leave this world. But you don't have to stay in the generation of the righteous. He came to put you in the generation. Uh, you don't have to stay in the generation of the unrighteous. He came to make you a partaker of his imputed righteousness whereby you are accepted of God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your wonderful word. Thank you, dear God. Help us to discern these things that we found in the Psalms here. Because it explains so much that we can't understand otherwise. 
So send us on our way with a clarity, Lord, with, with a view of who you are and a view of the world as you have revealed it to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Heads down.